Hope everybody's doing well today. I want to welcome everybody to the Unimpressed Podcast. And today we have a guy calling in from Arizona, and he is a former F-35 pilot and now author and has a best-selling book out there called Clear Thinking. His name is Hazard Lee. I want to welcome Hazard to the Unimpressed Podcast. Thank you, John. It's great to be on. So when I saw your story, I said, yeah, man, I want to talk to this guy and just dig in. And how did you get to being a pilot and doing some of the extreme things you did. I mean, what kind of mindset does that take? You have to be able to handle pressure well. So I went to an air show when I was five. I saw the Thunderbirds, Blue Angels fly, and I knew I wanted to be a fighter pilot uh, from that moment on. This was back in the day when you could sit in the cockpit. So hopped in the cockpit of an F-16, five years old, put the helmet on. It's like a bobblehead on me, but it was just like sitting in a spaceship, hundreds of buttons, uh, just an incredible experience. Experience. So, you know, as a kid, you can't do a whole lot as as a fighter pilot. So it wasn't until as a teenager that had a chance to uh, fly in a Cessna 152. Not sure if you're familiar with that, but it's like a, basically a lawnmower with wings. And so I had a chance to, to fly in that for the first time, knew that's what I wanted to do and applied to the Air Force Academy, got rejected. So I got a, I should have known better, a crisp white letter from them. You know, if you get in, you get a packet. So I got a crisp white letter and opened it, said, unfortunately, uh, you know, we don't have room for you. Good luck with your endeavors. And, uh, you know, was pretty uh, disappointed with that. And a couple of weeks later, I got another letter saying if I went to a prep school called New Mexico Military Institute, if I did well there, then I could go to the academy. And so went there, did well enough to get to the academy, got selected for pilot training, and then uh, went to pilot training. So that's kind of the, the background up to, uh, to flying for the Air Force. Now, when you, you talk about training, how does the military turn you down? What are, they, what are they looking for? And what did you have to learn at this school? Yeah. So the Air Force Academy is a little bit different. It's very academic heavy. So it's not like we're going out and, and flying very much at the academy. So my grades just weren't weren't good enough. It's uh, really competitive. I think only about 10% of people make it into the academy. So my grades weren't there. I went to that prep school and uh, just kind of learned standard college course stuff. And so I uh, did well enough there to, to make it to the academy. So they're looking for somebody who is academically good, who is uh, physically in good shape, who has character, who's volunteering for uh, different services, who shows leadership. So there's a bunch of different uh, gates that they're looking for you to pass through, but uh, which is a little bit different from actual pilot training. So you go through the academy for four years, very, very academic heavy. And then from then on, that's kind of um, things change. You're in the active duty Air Force and you're uh, learning how to fly jets. Your family have any military um, background or anything like that? My dad was a <clears throat> scientist, so he worked for the Department of Energy. So I was almost a military brat. We would move around, lived in California, Livermore National. Laboratory, Los Alamos National Lab. We spent a lot of time there where the uh, Manhattan Project was. So that's kind of where I call home. And that's where I took that first flight, which is, uh, it's a pretty incredible airfield. It's it's small, but it's built into these tall uh, mountains. So it's almost like a James Bond runway. And as soon as you take off, there's a, a cliff that you go off of. So uh, that was that was the first, uh, first taste of flight there that I enjoyed. Now, your dad's a scientist and what did mom do? Mom stayed home with us. So she also worked a little bit uh, until the kids were born. I have uh, a brother and sister, but as soon as we were born, she uh, she stayed at home. So what did mom and dad think about their son going to be a fighter pilot? They were supportive. I mean, I, I'm sure it causes my mom some stress deploying to Afghanistan, doing some missions over there. But uh, believe it or not, my brother is also a fighter pilot. He's an F-18 pilot for the Navy. So I think we've given them some gray hairs, but you know, they're, they're proud parents. You know, I think they're happy that we're happy. What makes you stand out? Uh, is it your decision making? Is it your functionality in the cockpit? I mean, what, you know, how do you know that you're becoming a great pilot? Well, I think in terms of being a good pilot, I, I don't think you necessarily have to really stand out in anything. And that's one of the, I think the beauties of Air Force pilot training is they take somebody who has never flown before off the street and within a couple of years, they're flying combat missions on the other side of the world. So I think what the training is, is really being able to stay calm under pressure, being able to make good decisions, being able to stay focused for long periods of time. Flying is is interesting. And it really clicked for me because I was never a great student. 
I boxed at the Air Force Academy intercollegiately, but I wasn't a, a great athlete. Flying, though, is where things really clicked for me because there's that studying element of it. It's um, it's it's not like flying in the civilian world. You're really it's more like being a, a football player memorizing different plays. Uh, we have a lot of different tactics, thousands of different tactics that we have to memorize, and then being able to actually go out there and execute. And there's a lot of pressure. You know, sometimes there's a thousand people that have touched the mission. So everybody from spies on the ground to intelligence operators to uh, tanker crews. So we refuel from airborne tankers and uh, they'll launch from different continents all to refuel us. And we're the last link in that chain. And if we screw up, then you know we screw up the work that they all did and that target may never resurface again. So there's a lot of pressure. You can imagine like the movies, those big uh, screens up on the board, the joint operation centers, everybody's watching what you're doing. So you know there is some unique circumstances that we get ourselves into, but I think it goes back to the training that we get. Because when you, you know, when you get on an airplane and you look left and you see the two pilots sitting up there and you see, it looks like a gazillion buttons, right? And you've got to memorize a thousand maneuvers and you're fighting it potentially fighting against an enemy. How do you learn all just just the buttons in a in a cockpit? I mean, that's that's a lot of different things and moving parts. How do you wrap your head around that initially? It's challenging and I had a chance to do it multiple times because I flew the F-16 for six years before transitioning to the F-35. And so I had a chance to be an experienced F-16 pilot. I knew what I was doing. And then switching into the F-35, I still had that airmanship, but the buttons did different things. So uh, we call it hands-on throttle and stick, HOTAS. And you can you can literally do thousands of commands just by keeping your hands on the stick and throttle. So there are probably a dozen buttons on each. Each button goes forward, back, left, right, down. You have long pushes, short pushes, and we have multiple master modes where if you switch master modes, all those buttons change again. So it takes a, a long time, a lot of studying, a lot of memorization. We do something called chair flying where we're visualizing, pushing all those buttons. And uh, we do academics. We do simulators. The simulators we have are incredible. F 35 single seat only. So as soon as you take off, you know, for as a as a new student, you alone have to land that aircraft. So it mostly comes down to studying, training, repetition. But for me, it took me about a year to go from thinking in F-16, translating it to F-35, uh, to just start thinking F-35, because that was taking about five seconds and the speeds were flying, were closing with the enemy about a mile every three seconds. So you have to be uh, you have to be thinking in the jet that you're flying in. Now, do they cater when they design these planes and these cockpits, do they cater it around human functionality? You know what I mean? Like, is there some type of simulation where, hey, let's see how their hands work. Let's see how movement works to trying to dial that in. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So they spend a lot of time trying to make it ergonomical for the pilot. And uh, actually, the F-16 was was pretty tough for me because it was designed for the average height. So it was designed back in the, uh, the 1970s. And so they wanted it to be perfect for the average American height, which is five foot 10. I'm six foot two, about 200 pounds. So I had to cram myself into the F-16. In fact, when I was wearing my survival vest and had my pistol on my chest, you know, I wouldn't be able to look back and actually see the buttons behind me because you know, there are hundred, hundreds of buttons all over. So I had to memorize where some of the buttons were. The F-35, we've learned a lot since the 1970s. It has a lot, a uh, lot more space in there. And then also we have a lot fewer buttons. So we've, we've paired all those things down to basically two giant iPad screens in front of me. So a lot of it is touch screen. And so instead of having hundreds of buttons in the F-35, we actually only have about 30 buttons and we also have no heads up display. So everything, all the information is pumped into my helmet. So uh, it's true augmented reality. When I'm flying, I see symbols over all the good guys and those symbols follow them around with all the information I need to, to work with them as a team. And then symbols over all the bad guys and what I need to do to engage that threat. And then at night, we have multiple cameras around the jet that can see in the pitch black and it fuses that all together and pumps it into my helmet so that if I want to, I can see through my body, see through the jet. So it's really incredible what these jets do uh, to be able to increase our situation awareness so we can be effective on the battlefield. So your first big interaction, military interaction, did you know what you were getting into like 24 hours before? Uh, are these things that are on the fly? Do you have to 
prepare? What was going through your head for this first experience? So it depends. Sometimes you'll be um, kind of on a response force. So if something kicks off, you'll be ready to go. So we did that quite a bit. But for our deployment to Afghanistan, we knew we knew several years in advance when we were going to go. We weren't quite sure the location, but we knew we were going to be deployed. And so I actually, I, I really wanted to go on the deployment. So I stayed back for a reclama, stayed back an extra year so that I could go on that deployment because I was one of the more more senior guys in my uh, squadron. So you, so you know uh, typically what you're going to do and you have a spin up period. I was a, what's called a wild weasel. So we go after surface air missiles. If you've seen the movie Top Gun, the latest one, those missiles on the canyon walls, that was my job at Shaw Air Force Base, not very far from you was uh, to try and take out those surface air missile sites. A lot different than the fighting going on in Afghanistan, which is close air support, helping the troops on the ground. So we went through a, a several month spin up period to really get good at that close air support mission so that uh, we could be effective out there. And you were very successful in one of your military actions. Can you tell us about, about that and what happened? Well, I think as a squadron, we were very successful. We were there during a really interesting time period. So when we first went out there, this was in 2016, the Afghanistan war was winding down. We were the only squadron in the country. And so we would go and support multiple operations each night, only 12 F-16s for the whole country, only 12 jets. So we'd be doing 24-hour ops, two aircraft flying at any given time for four to five hours. But uh, ISIS started taking hold of Afghanistan in uh, January of 2017. That coincided with uh, Secretary of Defense Mattis saying he wanted uh, all ISIS annihilated. So what went from a relatively benign deployment went uh, really hot and we started being used quite a bit. Pretty much every mission, we were cleaning the rails, dropping all our ordnance. The Special Forces soldiers, they were doing a lot of high-risk clearing operations along the Nangahar border, so the border with Pakistan. And so we would take off, we would support engagements uh, there. So we had a chance to uh, to really help uh, help the battlefield, which is, which is what you want to do as a fighter pilot. Now, would you say you have no fear? No, I, I definitely have fear. Um, what's interesting thing though is I've had several times where I've almost died uh, flying and every time and this isn't to like sound macho or something every time there's been no fear in the moment it's been I think the best way to describe it is detached curiosity where you're just kind of curious what's going to happen and the fear you, you're actually you're just focused on getting out of that moment and it's and it's pretty interesting you know you, we can do things uh, just sitting here you can meditate you can try to calm the world around you but it's really a, a life-threatening circumstance where all that noise goes away and you're fully focused on how to get out of that so it's actually something that uh, looking back is somewhat enjoyable but uh, uh, after you almost die, the fear comes later that night when when everything's calmed down. You're back uh, at your base. Maybe you're trying to sleep. That's when uh, that's when the fear happens. So I would think if it's very tactical, um, very thought driven, and almost have to stop some thoughts from coming into play. I mean, was there any preparation? Is this is this an engineer mindset? Is it a natural thing? Because you know, like in my world in entertainment, if someone's a great artist, they're a great artist. You know, and they kind of come from a pure source. Now, would you say there's a type of personality that that may have an engineering mindset, have the ability to eliminate some fear uh, that kind of rises to the top in, in being a fighter pilot? Yeah, definitely. I think being able to break down problems, the framework we use is ACE, being able to assess the problem in front of you, choose the correct course of action. Sometimes you have to come up with a custom solution. So uh, that involves a lot of creativity. So creativity is an part, important part of being a fighter pilot. I think one of the biggest misconceptions from people watching movies like Top Gun and uh, and Hollywood movies is that it's just kind of this 1v1 cage match or just a couple aircraft going up against the enemy's best aircraft. But really, it's like a three-dimensional chess match. You're, you're fighting in the air. You're fighting on the ground. Uh, you have space assets. You have cyber assets. And so you're trying to package all this together to defeat an enemy. And the enemy is doing the same thing. They're trying to define your weakness and they will apply maximum force at this weakness. So uh, there are a lot of different types, personality types, being a fighter pilot, but I'd say being calm under pressure, being able to think analytically, being able to be physical because we're pulling nine times the force of gravity. You can feel the the life draining out of you when you're turning that tightly. You know, your arms are like lead. The blood is being drained out of your 
your brain after I fly, it looks like I have chicken pox in my arms because the it's pressurizing my arteries and, and bursting the blood vessels in my arms and legs. And uh, if you lose enough blood, you will pass out. And the speeds we're flying, you will impact the ground in about 20 seconds, and it takes about 30 seconds to wake back up. So you need to have that that physicality. Uh, you also need to be aggressive. So there there are some traits that are important, but in terms of the the background of people come from uh, all walks of life. Now you have this book, Clear Thinking, and you said this was a best seller in the business space. You know, how did that translate to a business space? How did you come up with that to cross over to to make it successful? Yeah. So we have some unique training in the Air Force. And so there are a lot of different organizations that stop through these bases, NFL coaches, uh, CEOs, surgeons, all kinds of people come through and, and try to analyze some of our best practices. And so I knew a lot of this information would be useful to them. And I, I really wanted to write a book that that uh, took a lot of the principles that we'd learned because we focus on decision making. And that's something that applies to everybody. And I think there's never been a time uh, where decisions are more important than they are now. And the reason is because technology is leveraging the decisions we're making. And with the rise of AI, we're poised to, to see that grow uh, exponentially. So when I'm flying, I'm just in a suit of technology that amplifies everything I do. I'm, I can fly 100 times faster than I can run, carry 100 times more, see out to the horizon. But same thing for all of us, the phone you have in your pocket, the computer you have in front of you, all of that can amplify and do the job of dozens of people from just a, a couple of years ago. So uh, so it's really important, I think, to focus on decision making. There are reports out of Silicon Valley that the next billion dollar company will be run by three or fewer people, which is incredible. Just uh, 100 years ago, that would have taken hundreds of thousands of people. A couple of decades ago, that would have taken thousands of people. And now three people are going to be running a billion dollar company, which means that each decision that they're making is highly leveraged. And if you can just take one of those people from getting their decisions right from 80% to 82%, that's worth uh, $10 million. So it's really important to, to focus on decision making because I don't know about you, but I wasn't taught any decision making principles in school. It wasn't until I became a fighter pilot that I really started learning that. And that's something that, that goes back for us about 50 years to when... Uh, Colonel John Boyd developed kind of a famous framework called the OODA loop. What makes you make a good decision? Yeah, so it's a three-stage process. So first is being able to assess the problem in front of you. If you can't assess the problem in front of you, you're never going to be able to consistently make good decisions. Now, you know, we can dive pretty deep into that. So being able to assess the problem comes down to, for us, being able to have a good cross-check, being able to find the variables in front of us that are going to be important for our phase of flight. So when we're taking off, it's going to be different from when we're employing missiles to when we're landing. And really, the key is finding variables that adhere to what are called power laws. Most of uh, most humans, you know, we've, we've evolved to think linearly. You walk 30 steps, you're 30 steps away. But most variables don't adhere to a uh, linear principle. They adhere to power laws and they're really amplified by by technology. For instance, when you're flying, you know, if we have to eject, if you're going Mach 1.6, the force on your body is 300 times the force of your hand if you're sticking it out of a car window going 70 miles an hour. That uh, force uh, grows exponentially with uh, with velocity. So it's really important for us, even though we have dozens of steps in the checklist, to be able to just slow down uh, before we eject. Otherwise, you'll be uh, Rip to shred. So uh, that's exponential growth. I talk in the book of a business example. If you can uh, remember back to uh, the web portal days of the 1990s, you had excite.com, you had Yahoo, you had uh, AOL online. And so excite.com failed to buy Google uh, in 1997 for $750,000. And that's because Excite was hiring teams of journalists to review websites because back then, you know, there's spam on the internet. They're trying to figure out what's a good website, what's a bad website. And so they hired 75 journalists to go through all the websites to see what was good and what was bad, which was a linear solution. The internet was scaling exponentially. Today, if you wanted to, to use that solution, you'd need a team of 500,000 journalists reviewing those websites. So that was a case of them not understanding uh, the exponential growth. So exponential growth is one aspect, one type of power law. Another is the law of diminishing return. Most people are familiar with that from working out. You work out the first six months, you know, you, you see a lot of progress, then things start to taper off. And then the last one is uh, long tail 
power laws. That's why you see a few shows on Netflix that do really well and the rest just do okay. So being able to find those few key variables is important to being able to assess the problem in front of you. And then you can move on to choosing the correct course of action. Well, are you just showcasing human emotions, human ability? I guess there's human emotions, human ability, because I understand that I, I wrote this book called Finding a Perfect Audience. And there's a way to use content and eliminate unconscious bias. I can use this formula and create a pure source. And if you create a pure source, you can pin someone against the wall with any question they have. They'll have no more questions to ask. So really, the, those powers are wrapped around the human being, right? Because everything else is just tech mm -hmm. and numbers, data. You know, one of the themes of the book is that we shouldn't give up our critical thinking to what I call the three C's, to computer models, to committees, to consultants. So I see a lot of people who are particularly part of uh, big organizations that don't like to make decisions. They like to push that off to other people. But I mean, how many times have we seen committees make terrible decisions and after action reports? So one of the themes of the book is that you should come up with your own solution to problems using critical thinking. And the framework I use for that, it goes into the choose phase. So we talked about assess. Choose is finding the expected value of a decision. So what is the good that can happen? What's the chance of that happening? And then what's the risk? What's the bad that's going to happen? What's the chance of that happening? So I think being able to to hold yourself accountable to that is, is important um, before you start going to these these external sources, these other tools, they're just tools to aid you in your decision making, as opposed to uh, to pushing it off to other people that make decisions. So I think it, it starts with the person. Well, I mean, if you think about that, that's pure source. I think the CEOs are making a mistake because in my process, I mean, if you're going to let a, I don't know what you call it, when you interview 100 people, you know, a group interview to try to bring in data for a business. That's a very, that's very fractional information. And then if it's a third party company that they hire outside of their internal environment, then you're dealing with another disconnect because that third party company uh, is going to go out here and do the survey, but they don't even really know the sensibilities of the business, you know? So that's kind of a, you know, that kind of goes hand in hand that some of the, that thought process you said about CEOs is costing them money. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I agree. Right? Like you see, you know, focus groups aren't aren't the best tool for seeing what's good art and what's not. And so I think mm -hmm. there is, and you, I'm sure you'd be more of an expert than me in this, but I think that's why uh, it's been interesting to see Apple and some of these other streaming services come in and uh, and utilize that technique a little bit less. And so then you don't get as many laugh tracks and things like that. You get more of the artists who are working on a project who are who are able to uh, to instill their vision instead of something that's been watered down by by focus groups that really isn't the core audience. And then it's been run through, you know, executive producers and things like that. You you know, from my experience, you want the talented artist typically to be the one that is in charge of the vision. <clears throat> that can go hand in hand in entertainment. You know, I, me developing, I developed a thousand TV shows, spend a year of my life and would have a great talent and then go and then 20 people in a room tell me it wasn't worth the shit because they're only appeasing their own environment, you know, and they don't even really know the real world. And I think you can see uh, how technology Technology has somewhat created a law of attraction, law of attraction possibilities and in, in letting people make their own choices. And they don't even know they're making their own choices to determine things. And nobody's really wrapped their arms around that process. Mm -hmm. Yeah, You know what I mean? That's weird to me. Yeah. And in some ways, I think it can be a good thing. You know, social media has allowed unlimited leverage. So, you know, there are obviously problems, but anybody with a camera can now make a show and they can make it in their own vision because it doesn't take 500000 a million dollars to, to make a show anymore. And this is something that you know, I get a chance to do on YouTube. I make some some interesting content. I flew in the first civilian F-16, got a chance to go in the zero gravity uh, aircraft that you know replicates uh, zero gravity from space and, uh, and do some interesting things. But if this were back in the day, I would have had to pitch, you know, raise money, pitch some of these networks, and there's a good chance they would have said no to this. But because the barrier for entry is so low, I can go out there, do it on my own, and uh, and really follow my own vision instead of having it watered down by you know a bunch of other people who might not see my vision. We just hooked up with TikTok. I mean, we were a Meta partner for four years. I'm one of 30 companies in the world to Meta partner, and 
TikTok came and made us an offer uh, to help be an agency uh, for their live creator network program. And I got a, got a couple of guys coming in, a couple of their big wigs want to come in and talk to me. But when I look at that structure, uh, that's micro TV development. I think things, if you can, if you can understand pure source and then you can understand society. And I think another part, what I want to say earlier is, is businesses, because they are so insular uh, with their own environment, they, they don't pay attention to society, you know, cause it's when I'm looking at this TikTok thing, I could create Disney. I could create Disney world around this model and they don't even know it is, it's creating a pure source for talent, right? And it's linear to society. And that's kind of, hopefully that makes sense or whatever. But if you're not paying attention to society and you're in a corporation and you're only paying attention to your environment within that corporation, you're going to have problems. And it sounds like you could, you that resonates with you as well in a way, right? Yeah, absolutely. I think it allows, it, yeah, prevents that, uh, that group thing from happening. And so everybody has a chance to to put out content to see if it works. You know, there's, there's an interesting genre on YouTube of people that are into watching elevators like operate. And it's like millions and millions of views that would have never gotten picked up by some uh, executive at, uh, at an entertainment service. So, and actually what it does is it can help people. I think with some uh, like autistic people, it helps them the mechanical nature of watching elevators open and close. And so they're getting tens of millions of views on YouTube. So you're, you know, everybody can have, you can find a lot more niches, I think, with, with social media now. What's the narrative? You're, you know, former fighter pilot, still fly. Uh, have the book out. What's your mission now moving forward? Yeah, right now I've been talking about the book. Fortunately, it's done really well. So as as you said, best-selling book, number two book on the Wall Street Journal. So a lot of businesses have been asking me to come in and, and talk to their organizations. I really enjoy being able to distill down some of the lessons that I've learned as a fighter pilot and, and share it with them. Um, I really enjoy making some of these YouTube videos that we do. I the last one, I took a UFC fighter Tito Ortiz and put him in the centrifuge. He wanted to see if he could withstand the G forces. So that was a that was an interesting video to be able to do. So I really enjoy, you know, entertaining people with some of the avi aviation stuff that we do and educating them because there's not a lot of people in this space that are doing that. So you know, I've really enjoyed writing the book. I wrote every word of it. It took me uh, over 500 days in a row without missing a single day writing it. Um, so, you know, I, I just enjoy, enjoy sinking my teeth into to different projects like that. And also flying, flying the F-35. It's an incredible jet. You know, there's there's nothing like it. So it's uh, it's pretty good right now. So when you make a decision, if you have a question or you see something and need to respond, whatever it is, the first 10 seconds, I always say the first 10 seconds of perception is everything. And then there's a second thought process where you start rethinking that first 10 seconds. Do you go with the first 10 seconds? Yes. Typically, typically your first instinct is going to be the right one. So there are different levels of decisions. Some you have split second you know even even as a fighter pilot most decisions aren't split second you do have like five to ten seconds to make the decision some are split second you see a, a face full of jet in front of you you gotta move the stick otherwise you're gonna crash into them others you have five ten seconds some you have a few minutes sometimes we're planning missions that are years into the future so you have a lot of time to be able to assess the problem in front of you but the assessment phase actually responds back to uh those power laws. So the law of diminishing return, those first 10 seconds, you're probably going to learn just as much as the next, you know, two days combined. So, you know, if, especially if time is a factor, which I think it is for most people, we're inundated with hundreds or thousands of decisions and we just need to wait our way through it. No decision is a decision and it's usually the worst one to make. So just go with that first instinct, move on to the next decision, unless maybe it's one of those really important decisions. It's a one way door. You can't undo, undo it after. After the fact those ones you want to spend a little bit more time but uh those other ones just just go through it i think being decisive and being quick is a really important skill well i think it's great information and i think you've um after talking to you and understanding how your mind works i think you've translated something that probably hasn't been translated to the real world you know what i'm saying coming from your position as a fighter pilot i don't know if anybody's translated that narrative to make it understandable to the real world. Well, thank you. That's That was my goal from the beginning because as fighter yeah. pilots, we've been focused on this decision-making theory for 50 years. 
And I don't think it's really gotten out, not because it's uh, like classified or anything like that, just because we're really busy on the mission in front of us. And so I really wanted to to write a book that would be able to to share that because I really enjoy when other people do the same thing. One of my favorite authors is Atul Gawande. He wrote the Checklist Manifesto. He uh, He's a surgeon and then also a writer. So I think that adds a lot of richness to his writing where he can draw on his own stories to make some of the points that he's making. Cool, cool. So if we want to find Find the book. Where do we find the book at? You can find it anywhere there are books. So it, it was a, uh, it's one of Amazon's top books of 2023. Uh, editor recommended. Uh, it's one of Barnes and Noble's top books. The audiobook, I recorded all of it. And for the first time in Audible history, recorded parts from the jet. Um, so that's a pretty interesting thing for people that want to pick up the uh, the audiobook. But yeah, anywhere you find books, you'll be able to find it. It's called The Art of Clear Thinking. Uh, And then hazardly is spelled with an S. So H-A-S-A-R-D. Well, I think it's been a great conversation. I appreciate you coming on the show. Ladies and gentlemen, this has been Hazardly. And I'm John Edmonds Cosma, the CEO of Bang Productions. (laughs) 